السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله يا طيبين طاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد Dear respected brothers and also sisters listening, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. First of all, um, <clears throat> it's a privilege, it's an honor to be here in Sheffield at this masjid. I would like to thank the organizers, the brothers, the young brothers who have uh, organized this event, the Imam of the masjid the committee members and all the volunteers and everybody and all of you of course for coming attending this program today Sunday evening tomorrow morning you will have to go to work I actually wanted this program normally when I go to different cities I say it should be Saturday night but then I was told that Saturday night people in Sheffield are very busy so I think maybe driving taxis Allahu A'lam so Sunday was decided the topic today is actually very important and I have some very important things to say. I actually have some steps uh, regarding the talk, some important notes. Uh, normally I stand <clears throat> and put my notes on a stand, but I've not been feeling too well since yesterday and today as well. It's a bit tired. But I have very important points that I would like you to, and myself of course, all of us to listen to them attentively and see if we can act upon them, inshallah, make dua to Allah that we can act upon them and then bring some sort of change in our life. Because that's what's important. The topic, how to be happy. Who want, well, let me change the question. Who does not want to be happy? Who wants to be happy? Everybody. Wanting to be happy in this life and of course in the next life but even in this life there's nothing wrong in being happy and wanting to be happy somebody recently when i i think mentioned this somewhere that i have a talk how to be happy so somebody said why do you want to be happy for why do why does everybody want to be happy i mean how can you be happy in this world when people are being slaughtered and killed everywhere in the world our mothers and children are being slaughtered and we want to talk about being happy you see the point here is that there's a misunderstanding of what we mean by being happy Misunderstanding. You could be happy and you could have every single person of your family members passed away or martyred in the path of Allah. You could still be internally happy. You could be happy and not have a home to live in. You could be happy and not, not have no money whatsoever. The real happiness that we, would, we are talking about, that's what we need to understand first and foremost. We need to first define happiness. Because in order to acquire and achieve, because I said I have about six steps. We're going to talk about six different steps of acquiring happiness. But before we talk about those six steps of acquiring, achieving happiness, we need to first define, define happiness. What is happiness? Because happiness is something that every single human being, Muslim, non-Muslim, elderly, young, children, men, women, every human being wants to be happy in this world. But the problem is that everybody has their own definition. Everybody has their own criteria. Everyone has their own different understanding of what is happiness. People have different meanings, concepts of happiness. Islam has a specific concept. The Quran and Hadith has a specific meaning and definition of happiness. And that's why what we need to first do is to define the meaning of happiness according to the Quran, according to the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we act upon those methods, those steps, those means, those levels, those ways, those manners 
of acquiring that happiness. So what is happiness according to the Quran and Hadith, according to Islam, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In Arabic you have two terms used for happiness. Many terms, maybe more than two, but two I just wanted to uh, bring up today. One word that is used to describe happiness in Arabic is farah. What is it? What is it in Arabic? Farah. You know, some people have uh, the name farih. Farih means happy. Fariha, a female who is happy. So one word that is used is farah. Another word is surur. Both are words and terms and uh, words that are used, phrases that are used in Arabic to describe happiness. But there's a difference between the two. Farah refers to external happiness. External happiness. Someone who's got a bit of temporary, external, temporary pleasure. Someone is, in the, you know, somebody is eating some nice food, okay? Right now, when he's eating that plate of biryani, he's enjoying it, that's external happiness. But in his mind, he knows that something's wrong at home or he has to go you know, somewhere in the jail in the morning, okay? Or somebody in the prison, somebody, somebody's at the prison eating a plate full of biryani. When he's eating biryani, enjoyable food, there's external happiness, but internally, overall, that person is unhappy. So farah refers to <coughs> external, temporary enjoyment, and that's why whenever the word farah has been used in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it in a negative way. Allah says actually, لا تفرح إن الله لا يحب الفريحين Don't be temporarily happy. Allah is telling us, لا تفرح Because Allah does not like those people who are just externally uh, overjoyed and externally happy. Whereas another term which is used in Arabic in the Quran and Sunnah to describe happiness is surur. Surur is from the word sir. In Arabic, secret is known as sir. Secret is known as sir. So surur is a word which is taken from sir, which means it's hidden secret happiness. What do you mean by secret happiness? Internal happiness, happiness of the heart, the peace and tranquility of the heart. Externally, you might have two pounds. Externally, you don't even have a house to live in. Externally, you don't have no wealth, no property. But internally, your heart is at peace. You are in a state of tranquility, contentment. And this is what Islam means and describes as happiness. Happiness of the heart. That's why they say some of the Arabs early said, some of the early scholars, نَظَرَةٌ فِي الْوَجْحِ وَسُرُورٌ فِي الْقَلْبِ That sometimes someone who is happy internally, you have a glow on their face, but internally they are happy, the hearts are happy. And this is a real meaning of happiness, not external. That's why happiness is not in cars, not in properties, not in wealth, not in money, not in health, not in family members, not having you know luxuries in this world. That's not happiness. Happiness is the feeling inside. Happiness is the contentment of the heart. It's the tranquility of the heart. And this is what is happiness. And that's why we have to define this happiness. We have misunderstood what happiness is. We have misunderstood. This is why I mean, you may, may have heard of this all the time. People say money cannot buy happiness. And this is not just a phrase that we just say just like that. How many of us really believe in the fact that money cannot buy happiness? It is actually true, not from an, it's just an Islamic point of view, but from a psychological point of view, from people who've actually carried out research on this topic. And I actually once did a talk and, and I have a small article which I'm gonna just tell you some few things from there. There was a non-Muslim was a massive equity investor millionaire you could google this this is online this article and his name was James Montia what he said some of the things he said very similar to what Islam says he actually is there's a, there's a article check it up online the psychology of happiness 13 steps to happiness I have six steps which we're going to talk about some of them are very similar to his 13 but we're not going to talk about his 13 steps but this was a equity investor after being a millionaire and um, investing a lot of money, having properties, luxuries, you know, massive corporations, business. He says here, look, this is, sometimes because when it comes from people like that, then we take it more seriously, sadly. When it comes 
and we shouldn't be reading like that. It should be, if it comes from the Quran and Hadith, then we should take it more seriously. But that's our psychology, so sometimes it's important to uh, also mention this. Uh, just some things that he said. He said, many of us believe that money will make us happy, but it won't. This is a person who has billions. After earning millions and billions, he's writing this. Money will not bring us happiness except for the very poor. You know what that means? Except for the very poor. If someone is extremely poor, someone who is extremely poor does not even have enough money to buy some food and eat, you give that beggar 10 pounds, that 10 pounds will make a difference between remaining hungry at night and eating some food. So yes, for that extremely poor person, money will bring some sort of happiness because he is hungry, thirsty, extremely hungry, he hasn't eaten for three, four days, but today he has a meal because he has some money. He is cold, shivering on the road, on the street. You give him five pounds, he'll buy a blanket and cover himself, save himself, protect himself or herself from cold. Yes, that five pounds will make that person happy. But those who are not extremely poor, a person earning 1,000 pounds a month and someone earning 2,000 pounds a month, not going to make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. Extra money, what? You will eat one, mus one more samosa in Ramadan, two more samosas, you know, pastries, a bit more food. Are you going to use two more blankets, three more blankets? It, it, it's just mental and it's psychological. Mentally, psychologically, we think the way we think. That extra money will bring us happiness. So more money will not buy happiness, it will bring happiness except for the extremely poor. Instead of, now he says, instead of dreaming of a lot of wealth, we should dream of good things that we can do, like close friends, close friends, healthy bodies, meaningful work. Uh, and then he, he says that the human beings, now this is his research, 50% of human beings are such that, sorry, with human beings, 50% of happiness comes from a genetic set point. He's divided them into humans, into, you know, or happiness into three categories. Number one, 50% of our happiness comes from a genetic set point. What that means is that this is something we don't have control over. We have been created. Some people are naturally more cheery and happy. It's just, it's, it's genetically you're created. We are all created with a certain level of happiness. Some people are just naturally more cheery than others. So you can't do anything about that. You know, maybe your father was very joyful, always joking. So then you're always joking and happy as well. Your grandfather, it's in the genes, it's running. You know, your, your, your father was short, so you are short. People say, I'm very short. I say, my father, I'm actually an inch taller than my father. So this is genetic. This is genetic. Um, so 50% we can't do anything about because it's something that we are, we are created with. 10% he says after that, so that's 50. Now 10% is because of our circumstances. Again, we don't have control over them. Like for example, the country we're living in, the city we're living in, or the race, our age. Age, you might be more happy when you're 30, less happy when you're 50, more happy maybe when you're 52. So it's the age, it's your gender, it's your personal history. That what it brings happiness for 10%. So that's 60% gone. No control of the 60% of our life in order to bring happiness. So it remains, how many percent remains? Only 40% uh, remains. In this 40%, according to this James Monty, a non-Muslim researcher, he says that this 40% is the area where we as human beings can change and bring some more peace and tranquility. And in this 40%, it has nothing to do with money, it has nothing to do with wealth, it doesn't have nothing to do with uh, uh, properties and wealth. It's about being busy, about building relationships, about being healthy, about doing the things that you like when you, when you do service for community. And then he has, you know, 13 steps. He also says, here look what he says, he says, a vast array of individuals, meaning lots of people, seriously overrate the importance of money in making themselves and others happy. Study after study from, from psychology shows that money doesn't equal happiness. And then he says here, if the United States is generally wealthier than it was 30, 40 years ago, why aren't the people happy or more happy? There are people depressed, seriously. More, with more money, people are more depressed. 
just recently how many people we hear in the news lots of people like to hear about football players and you know sports stars so many of them there's actually actually somebody contacted me because there's so many sports stars who are actually after some of them whilst they're playing or where the career when the career is ending and many of them after their career finishes these are remember people who earn 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100,000 a week. How much? 100,000 a week. Some people who don't know about sports will think, you know, this is crazy. Many of them are getting depressed. Many. They are going into alcoholism and the drugs and they just, they just have empty lives. They have 10, 20, 50, 30 properties. 200,000 a week they've earned. They don't have to work. They have a vacuum. They have a vacuum in their life emptiness in their life and that's why they actually there's organizations now being set up to help these people to remove them from their depression and they are looking at who can help they're actually looking at even Muslim people this is why somebody contacted me they want to they want to contact maybe some Muslim organization or some scholars who would be able to sort of help from a religious point of view so you have some Muslim players they want Islamic advice so they want them to be helped as well just two, three days ago, somebody contacted me. So, the more money someone has, doesn't mean that they are going to be more happy. Because this is not internal happiness. It's not the happiness of the heart. Uh, and he goes on many, many other things he, he mentions here. Uh, why aren't rich people happier? Perhaps, with, yeah, this is very important. Perhaps it's because many of them are workaholics. Why aren't rich people more happy than the average people? Because many of them are probably workaholics. Because they are more focused on money than <coughs> on the things that will bring them happiness. Very important point. Sometimes we are so engrossed in our work, in our jobs, that the reason why we are working for will be overlooked that. So we're working until we're 70, 80, and then before we even enjoy that, we're in the grave. We're in the grave. We're all that hard work. A type of job or work where we don't even have time to spend with our sons, our daughters, our children, our families. No time whatsoever. Workaholics. This is not what Islam advocates, brothers and sisters. This is not what Islam advocates. There was a re recently, or a few years ago maybe, there was a, uh, like a discussion going on in one of the radio stations. I was listening to it. And they were talking about... Um, they, they did a phone in asking people, young, no, they actually talked about, they did a survey. They went to schools, many schools from, you know, different backgrounds, white, black, Muslim, Asians, non-Muslims. And they spoke to children from 10 years age to 15 to 16 or 17, asking them, are you happy? Are you at peace? What brings you most happiness? What your parents do for you? And they did a survey. This was a research. What they found was about 80% of the children, what they said was not, when they were asked, what brings you happiness in life? The answer wasn't that we have a big house to live in, or my daddy has a massive car, so I can go in his car, or because we go for a lot of holidays. No. 80% of children responded by saying the thing that makes us the most happy is that we have a meal together as a family in the evening every day. We have a meal together as a family at home. I am able to see my father. I am able to see my mother. Brothers and sisters, we all together. This is what you call fostering rela relationships. This brings happiness. You could live in a rented house and spend quality time with your family far better than living in a mansion and never seeing your family or seeing them hardly every other week. So, this is what this uh, researcher is saying as well. And then he goes on to 13 steps of better life, you know, which he's mentioned and we have some steps. So this is what we need to know, define happiness. According to Islam, according to the Quran and Sunnah, real happiness is internal, everlasting, not temporary, internal happiness of the heart. This is also described as in the Quran and in, in Islam as qana'ah. This is what we call qana'ah. Qana'ah and rida bil qadr, or sorry, rida bil qada. 
Qana'a means contentment. Rida bil qada means being happy with the qadr, the, the fate, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what how happiness comes in the heart. Being content, being happy. Whatever Allah has given us, we are content and we are happy with that. Okay? So this is this is the definition of happiness. Before we go on to mentioning those steps, I hope you've understood that the definition of happiness. And also the ulama also say that this is sometimes it's a it's a ni'mah, it's a gift, it's a bounty from Allah. It's an ata min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's it's a uh, a quality or an attribute of the heart it's a condition of the heart that Allah blesses some people he makes them happy he makes their their hearts happy we have to also understand that there's a difference between you know one of the other words used for happiness is rah in urdu as well they say rahat in arabic raha raha means in urdu aram means what uh, what does it mean in english raha anybody Sorry? Comfort. comfort. Yes. Raha, comfort. There's a massive difference between Raha and Asbabu Raha. There's a big difference between what? Comfort and the means of comfort. These are two separate things. What we have done, we've made them one. We've confused them. We, we think comfort is, does come in or comfort is the the means of comfort. Someone can have the means of comfort, money, wealth, property, cars, whatever, but not have comfort and peace and tranquility. Someone else can have comfort, but not the means. Someone can have comfort and not the means. Somebody can have means, but not the comfort. Asbabu raha is something else. Comfort is something else. Peace and tranquility is something else. And the means of peace and tranquility and happiness is something else. And that's why we see sometimes that someone who has all the means of happiness, yet internally unhappy. Internally, there are incidents, there are so many incidents. There's an incident mentioned in one of the books by one of the scholars that once there was a person who, actually this is related from some of the earlier source that, uh, and I don't know the absolute authenticity of, of the report. Um, Mr. Taqif Mani mentions this, and I'm sure he must have verified the authenticity of this. But that somebody met, and it's possible, we don't get over, uh, you know, sort of enthusiastic or over happy, uh, over, you know, zealous about this, these issues, but it's just an incident. Somebody met Sayyiduna Khadir, alayhi salatu wasalam, and it's possible. There's a big discussion amongst the muhaddithun and the fuqaha about Khadir, alayhi salam. Was he a prophet or not? Nothing's categorical. There's different opinions. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in his Fatul Bari mentions opinions of the scholars, there's loads of opinions. Some said he was a prophet, some said he wasn't, some said he was a wali. Is he still alive or not? Some said yes, some said no. Is it possible to meet him? People have met him, some say no. So there's nothing categorical and, and you know, it's not something that we should have a big debate about. It's just an incident that was mentioned that somebody who, Allah Alam, he met Sayyidina Khadir Now, Sayyidina Khadir, peace be upon him, he said to him that make a dua. No, ask me, I'll make dua for you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will accept. Do you have any need? Do you want to be like anyone in this world? No. Do you, do you have a need? I'll make dua and Allah will accept it. So he said, yes. Can you please make dua for me? And I will also make dua that Allah makes me extremely happy so I have no sadness, no sorrow, no hardship, nothing in this life. Nothing. Sayyidina Khadir said, that's not possible. This is dunya. You have to also remember, dunya, akhirah. You know, we have in akhirah, we have jannah, jahannam. Jannah, paradise is just bliss. Hellfire, may Allah save us all. I mean, it's just misery, hardship, punishment. Dunya is a combination of both. It's in the middle. You have difficulties, hardships. Externally, you will have. We will all experience. Allah says that. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وثمرات وبشر الصابرين we will surely test you with decrease in wealth economically you will be tested and بشيء من الخوف there will be fear you might have war you might live in Syria and suddenly there will be fear 
and you will be tested by your close family members passing away and dying. They will be martyred. People will die. People will pass away. Your son will die. So this is a test. Dunya is just a test. So what an ablunakum bi shay min al khawfi wal ju'i wa naqsim min al amwal wal anfus your wealth will become decreased wal anfus wa thamarat you'll have you'll be tested in this life every person whether you're pious or not remember this brothers and sisters whether you're pious or not every single person will be tested you know sometimes what happens and remember I was mentioning the story of Khadr alayhi salam before I mentioned that some of us, we make a big mistake, which is that we equate practicing deen to being happy in this life. So you're not being happy, because internally you will be happy, but with, with having no hardships. Like someone says, oh, you know, I don't know why I have so much marriage problems or trouble in life. Why? I pray all my salah. Since, since when did Allah give guarantee that if you offer salah, you're not going to be, be half happy, you're not going to have hardships? Rather, there's a hadith, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا صَبَّ عَلَيْهِ الْبَلَاءُ صَبَّ When Allah loves his slave, he gives him more hardship to purify him, to enter him straight into Jannah. So don't ever make this mistake that the more pious you become, then that means you should have less difficulties, hardships. No. If we were to look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our hardships are nothing in comparison to, to the hardships of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The most hardships anyone ever experienced was the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was the Prophet of Allah. Why didn't Allah just make him rich and wealthy? Actually, he was given that choice, but he said no. Angel came and said, if you want the mountain of Ahad to be turned into gold and give it to you, he said no. He actually chose. You know, he was poor. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was poor. We know that. He used to actually make dua. Allahumma ahshurli fi zumratil masakeen. Oh Allah, resurrect me with the group in the group of the poor people. Okay? But we have to remember that his poverty was a poverty of choice, not a poverty which was forced upon him. He chose to remain poor. He did not want to. So this is a mistake that we should never make. That if we are, because what will happen is that when we have hardships and difficulties, then we will think, okay, now we don't want to. You know, if Allah is not, Allah is not listening to me, that means, okay, why should I carry on? Are we doing favor to Allah? Allah just giving us eyes to see is enough that we should be in sujood for the rest of our lifetime. Just these eyes, just close our eyes for a minute. You know, we should sometimes do that. Walk around for 10 minutes with your eyes closed. And think, just imagine if I was blind. Just imagine. Just imagine, just one sight that Allah has given us. No hardship. Just to pay Allah back for that, we could remain in prostration and sujood for eternity, still not enough. So this is a big mistake that we make sometimes. That we are, it's like we're doing Allah a favor. I pray my five time prayers. I give sadaqah. I go for hajj. I'm doing so much good deeds. Yet, why is this happening to me? This is nothing. Really, it should, much more should be happening. Because my prayers are not really the way they should be. So anyway, this person, when he came to Khadr he said, make dua to Allah. I have no difficulties, no hardships in life. No hardships. He said, look, that's not possible. That's not possible. You live in dunya. Yes, Jannah, in paradise, that will be the case. But in this life, it's not possible that you have no external hardships and difficulties. Not possible. You could be internally peaceful, but externally, it's not possible. However, I give you a suggestion. I can make a dua for you, and you also make dua to Allah directly. We both make dua to Allah that Allah make you like the most happiest or the most uh, fortunate or the most uh, <coughs> affluent person that you see. He said, yes, okay, that's great. So Khadr alayhi salam said to him, okay, go and see someone who you think you want to be like and then come back and we'll both make dua to Allah that you become like him. So the guy, he went one or two days in his locality community looking, searching, he went to one person. Some people said, this guy, he has everything. So he looked around, searched around, and did some investigation. Then he found, no, 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 he's actually got, hasn't got an arm or something. He said, no, no, not him. Somebody else, <coughs> this one, definitely. But he has this issue. He went to the third person, fourth person, fifth person. He couldn't just find someone perfect. Finally, he came across one person who had a mansion and property and luxuries and children and grandchildren and, you know, home and everything you want. He said, yes, this is the person. So he met this person, and he was really impressed by this person. 
<coughs> met him, and then afterwards he started speaking to him. So this person asked him then, what, what are you investigating? He said, this is what it is, and that's it. I'm going to Khadr and we're both going to make dua to Allah. Allah, make me like you. He said, before you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, whatever you see here, you think I'm really happy? And then he told him his internal private life story. And he said, this, everyone in the world thinks I have everything, but look, sit down. And then he spoke to him and he told him a few things. And he said, some of these grandchildren, they're illegitimate. Some of my children are illegitimate. My wife went and committed adultery, and then they, they, some of them are illegitimate. And I have problems, and I have this problem, and I have that problem. And he mentioned problems that this person was thinking that I am in Jannah, comparison to this person. And then he thought that, yes, you know what, I made a mistake. There's nobody in this world who does not have external problems. We need to take this thought out from our mind that we will not have external problems. It just doesn't work like that. This is a test. Dunya is a test. It's a short, small, brief 50, 60, 70 years of passing by. It's, it's like, Kun fi dunya gharib or sabil. The Messenger وسلم, said, Live in this dunya as though you are a foreigner, a traveler, and not just, not even that, rather just a passerby. You're just passing. You've just come to Sheffield, you're passing, and you're going, you're going away. You know, if I don't have you know, everything when I'm just coming to another city, or not even a city, it's like a service station on the, on the, on the you know, motorway. This is what dunya is. If you have a bit of hardship on the service station, no problem. You're not staying here forever. You're going to go. So this is, this is why in this world, externally, it's very difficult that nobody has any problems. But what we can acquire and achieve is that Islamic definition of happiness, which is happiness of the heart, which is sukoon, which is tamanina, which is um, uh, peace, Tranquility, surur fil qalb. And this only comes by, as I said, what did I say? This only comes by qana'a. This is the word that we need to remember, golden principle. Qana'a, contentment. Being content with what Allah has given us. And number two, rida bil qada. Being rida, rida. You know, it's like being happy, pleased with the qada. Rida bil qada with the qada, the decree, the fate, the decision that Allah has made for me and you. If Allah has made a decision for me to be very rich or very poor or tall or short or healthy or not healthy, yes, we take the means to bring you know goodness into our lives. But then, whatever Allah has decided for us, we are content internally. And this only comes, brothers and sisters. This can only come if we meditate and think and reflect about the shortness and the mortality of this life. We think to ourselves, okay, this is just a short life, it's okay, it's not a problem. Someone close by has passed away, it's okay. How many years? 10, 15 years. This is why in that verse, what does Allah say? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Those people who have hardship, musiba, calamity, difficulties, what do they say? And this is not just saying. Another problem of ours is that we only say things. The real benefit is to contemplate and understand what we say. We have a very beautiful poster here. Adhkar min sunnah You know, to offer, to recite after salat. But, and very good that we have translation. As all of us, and I'm sure many of you may have, taken the time to go and stand there and reflect and read the meanings. If we read with the meanings, it brings a massive change in our lives. The du'as, the supplications we read, we should know the meanings of them. You know, I have a young son, he's about four years old. He's just started, you know, just reading. So I may teach him du'as at home. Now, with the du'as, he's only four. So he's just about, you know, he's not even, he just started school this year. So I'm making him read and memorize the du'as. But not just the Arabic du'a. When I teach him the du'a, I say to him, memorize it. So he memorizes it. When you enter the toilet, the washroom, what do you do? What do you read? He says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal-khabai. 
What does he mean? Oh Allah, please save me, protect me from the man jinnat and shaitan, from the female jinnat and shaitan, and please save me. So when he goes before the entering the toilet, he'll say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min khawtim wal khabai. Oh Allah, please protect me. Don't let the male shaitan and the female shaitan come into it. You know, it's a dirty place inside here, and they like to come here. So please just, if they want to come, just protect me and make a door between them and me. He'll say all of that and then enter the toilet. So why am I reading that? Khubut means a male shaitan. Khabaith means the female shayateen. Khabith is a plural of khabitha. Khabaith is a plural of khabitha. Khabitha is one female shaytana, you know, evil shaytana. And khabaith is a plural of female shayateen. So every dua, every dua, even after prayers, why are we reading? What are we reading? Why are we reading? Contemplation makes a big difference. So when we say, in, in, when we have musibah and hardship, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Inna lillahi, we all belong to Allah. My father has been taken away, my mother has been taken away, my son has been taken away, my sister, my brother, my husband, my wife. They belong to Allah and I belong to Allah. We all belong to Allah. If something belongs to someone and they take it away, then we can't complain. You remember that story of Abu Talha and Umm Sulaim, the famous in Sahih al-Bukhari and elsewhere, famous story when his son was really ill and he left for work and when he came back he said how is the son and that famous story and his wife actually prepared a good meal for him and then really in a nice way explained to him and asked him and said to him look you know can I ask you something if our neighbor <coughs> borrowed if we borrowed some oil from our neighbor and then our neighbor after a week or so requested that oil back would it be wrong for us to would it be wrong for us to feel bad that they want their oil back? He said, No, of course. If they gave us something, it's a favor. If they want it back, we give it back, of course. So she said, in the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gifted us, granted us as a man, a son, and truly Allah has taken our son away. Belongs to Allah. Inna lillahi. We all belong to Allah. And the second part, wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. This person has gone today. We will all be returning to Allah. Life is very short. Number one, we belong to Allah, so Allah can test us. If you belong to someone, they test us, they can do what they want with us and to <coughs> us. So we belong to Allah, Allah has a right to test us. And we will return to Him, so the test is very short. We will, it's just 10, 10, 15 years, it's okay. 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. But Nothing in comparison to the eternal, <coughs> eternal hundred million, billion, trillion years in the next life. So life is very short, so the test is very short. So focus more on having a better hereafter rather than a better here, this world. Focus more on, that's why the hadith says, اِعْمَلْ لِدُنْيَاكَ بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِكَ فِيهَا وَعْمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِكَ فِيهَا Work for this life as long as you need to live in this life. Work for the next life as long as you need to live in the next life. This life is 60 years, so work like it's 60 years. But we know we will be 60 years, or 65 years, or 70, or maximum 75. But we work as though we're going to stay here for eternity. And the next life is eternity, but we work as though we're going to be there for 60, 70 years. You know, we've changed it around. So this is what the hadith says. So what we need to bring, this is, I'm still defining, and then I've got these six steps, so I'm going to do them quickly. Qana'a and rida bil qada. Remember these two terms. Contentment, contentment. <coughs> what this basically means is that what we do in, in the world, three things. Number one is we take the means to have a blissful life. We take the means, of course. This doesn't mean that, okay, this is life is short, so I'm not going to work from tomorrow. It's okay. That's it, no work. No, we take the means. Earning wealth and money is actually very important. Actually, there's books written. We don't know. We don't need these books in this day and age. There was this one great Hanbali Imam. His name was Imam Khalad. He was actually a student of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahimahullah, radhi anhu. He wrote a very good small book in which hathu al tijarati wa sinaati wal hirfa, encouraging people to go and trade and do business and commerce with all great hadiths and statements of the Sahaba and the Athar. In his time, there was a book needed. Why? Because, because there were some people who were too religious and they were saying, we're very spiritual, that's it. We don't need the dunya. They were giving divorce to the dunya. And he proved 
But this is not Islam. Rahbaniya is not part of Islam. The Quran of Allah says, Rahbaniya tajib tada'uha la sarurata fil Islam. Monasticism is not part of Islam. So we take the means. Number one, we take the means. Number two, we take the halal means. Sorry, the first one, take the means which are halal. So we take the means. Kasbul halali faridatun ba'd al faridah, as the hadith says. Earning of halal wealth. Actually, there's rewards and virtues. The hadith in Sunan Tirmidhi, a tajr al saduq al amin ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiqina wa shahadai wa salihin. A businessman, a tradesman who is working, earning wealth, but who is truthful and trustworthy. Very big conditions. Sadiq and Ameen. The two conditions of the Messenger the, sorry, the two qualities and attributes of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa who is truthful and trustworthy on the day of judgment, he will be resurrected with the truthful, the righteous, and the prophets, and the salihin, and the martyrs. Ma'an nabiyyin, wa siddiqeen, wa shuhadai, wa salihin. This hadith is in the sunnah of Imam Tirmidhi. But very important conditions, truthful. Yes, somebody gives you one penny extra, you pay that penny back. Somebody gives you extra change, you go and pay that money back. And trustworthy, not involved in fraud, in cheating, in deceiving, observing the proper business, moral business ethics. That's when we become with the prophets, the martyrs, and the righteous, and the anbiya. And on the other hand, if we don't, remember there's no middle way. This is very serious. There's no middle way, there's no like middle. There's actually extreme right, extreme left. The other hadith in the same chapter, Imam Tirmidhi mentions the next hadith. التجار يحشرون يوم القيامة فجارا إلا من اتقى وبر وصدق. All the tradesmen and businessmen on the day of judgment will be raised as sinners, fujar, fajr. They'll be all sinful people, except the one who fears Allah in his business and trade, except the one who is sadaqa, who is truthful, and except the one who is righteous. So either we are righteous and we are with the prophets and the <coughs> martyrs, or we are not righteous, we deceive and we commit fraud, we are in the hellfire, may Allah save us all. There's no middle way. So the first method of acquiring this internal, you know, this, this quality of qana, the, the, the meaning of qana'ah is to take the halal means of acquiring wealth and means of happiness. Number two with moderation. Number two with moderation. Remember, moderation, don't become workaholics. Like, you know, that researcher said, that we work day and night, work our socks off, and we can't even share a meal with our family. Number one is taking the means, halal means. Number two, with moderation. And then number three, thinking to ourselves that whatever Allah has given after taking these me this means and after putting in the effort, be content, internally happy with whatever Allah gives us. This is what we call qana'ah, and this is, this is the definition of this happiness. And this is why the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى عَنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ The real richness is not because of excess in wealth. It's not because of increase in, poverty, in property and in money. It's not because of increase in wealth. The real richness is غِنَى النَّفْسِ It's the richness of the heart. That's the real richness. And also there's a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, وَرْضَى be happy with what Allah has divided for you, make taqseem for you, you will be the most happiest of people. And seriously, brothers and sisters, the day we bring this quality into our lives, what's the quality? Qana'ah. Remember this word. Make hibs of this word in Arabic. Qana'ah. The day we bring this quality into our lives, Contentment, being content, being happy. Okay, whatever Allah's decreed, I'm internally happy. That's decided for me, no complaint. That's the day we will be the happiest in our lives. And we'll have the, that's the day when we will have this internal peace and tranquility. Because remember, qana'a, we have to have qana'a because if we don't have that, what's the opposite of qana'a? What's the opposite of qana'a? Not being content. When you're not content, you could have a lot of wealth, you are still not content. If you have one property and you don't have the quality of qana'ah, you want another property. If, you're, if you have two properties and you don't have qana'ah, you want a third property. That's why the hadith of Bukhari, لَوْ كَانَ لِبْنِ آدَمْ وَادِيًا مِنْ ذَهَبْ لَبْتَغَى وَادِيًا If Ibn Adam, okay, not just me, all of us. 
If the son of Adam had one valley of gold, he would seek two. If he had two, he would seek three. And the hadith mentions just until here, but this doesn't mean only until three. Rather, carries on. If you have five, you want six. If you have six, you want seven. وَلَا يَمْلَأُوا جَوْفَ إِبْنِ آدَمْ إِلَّا تُرَاب You will carry on aspiring, wanting more, more, more until death comes. That's why, because remember, brothers and sisters, none of our, you know, our desires in this world will never end. Our desires will never end. We will have one thing, we want another. So if we have qana'ah, then even less will make us content. But if we don't have qana'ah, we can have more and we'll still want more and more. And this is what we need to do. Now quickly moving on to these six steps. I have how many steps? So I've defined happiness. What's the definition of happiness? Not external, temporary joy. It's not farah. It's not just external things that bring us happiness. It's not just a nice food we've had, or a nice car we're driving, or a nice cozy comfort, you know, bed of comfort and cozy bed. That's not, that's just external temporary, at the moment joy. Mentally, we are not happy. The definition of happiness is the internal, the long-term, the everlasting, the long-lasting contentment of the heart, and that's the definition. Now, what are these means? How do we bring this into our lives? Number one. What's number one? Anybody? Number one, this is taken from the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's a hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Sayyiduna Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu relates that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Unzuru ila man huwa asfala minkum, wa la tanzuru ila man huwa fawqakum. فَإِنَّهُ أَجْدَرُ أَلَّا تَزْدَرُ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ Absolutely authenticated Sahih which is in the hadith of the hadith which is in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Look at people who are below you, who are at a low, lower level. Do not look at, in Salat al is at nine. Do not look at, Adhan is at Kush nine. Do not look at people above you. Look at people below you. Do not look at people above you. Because if you do that, it is very likely the chances are that you will not be ungrateful to the bounties and the ni'mah of Allah. You'll be grateful to the ni'mah of Allah. This is a golden principle given to us by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In worldly matters, in worldly matters, look at people below you. If you have a house, Look at, if you have a big property, look at people who are living in a smaller property. If you have a smaller property, think about, look means think about, ponder, reflect on the people who are renting houses. If you are renting a good house, think about those people who are in council rundown properties. If you are in a rundown council house, go into the streets of Sheffield and look at people who are homeless, sleeping rough on the streets. And if you're that, you can still carry on looking to someone who doesn't have legs. At least we can even sleep. There are people who can't even sleep. Look at people below you. If you are healthy, you can see with your eye if you've got a problem, you've got some health problem, think about people who are who don't even have legs. Who don't even have legs. Look at them. And if we can't think about them, then go and seek out these people. Go to a hospital where there's people who are hands are chopped off and cut off, who don't have legs. The moment we think of people aspire more, and we are being okay, a bit, and this is the greatest remedy, I said to some of my friends, I said, the greatest remedy is the moment you feel a bit sad, you know what you should do? Go home, go onto the internet, and put on like a clip of family members who are tortured in Syria, burnt, legs are burnt, hands chopped off, pieces of their body cut off, and some of them are still smiling. Just look. Go onto YouTube or whatever and look at the clip of someone in extreme distress. My problem, your problem, brother and sister, will seem absolutely insignificant. There's nothing. Our problems are nothing. There's nothing. And some of these people, subhanAllah, if you, if you, if you, you know, hear from them, family members have been destroyed. Some of them are saying, Alhamdulillah, I'm still alive. At least I'm seeing. My, my son has gone marching in the path of Allah. I'm happy. I'm happy. Allah, Allah accepted my son. So this is what we need to do. This is the hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
Because the problem is, the issue is that if we look at people above us, what will happen? We look at someone, we, we have a, you know, 5,000 pounds car. We look at someone with a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Porsche or whatever. I don't know if you have those in Sheffield. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, you're probably you do. But look at people in luxury. It'll just bring misery into your life. It's just, it's going to cause you misery. So why look at people above? Always look at people below. Think about, look at and think about the thousands of people in prisons. We're free, we're walking around, we can come out of the masjid, go home, we can see our children. Thousands in prisons. Think about thousands of people in hospitals. Think about thousands of people who are blind. Think about thousands of people who don't have legs to walk with. Think about thousands of people who don't have a home they are sleeping rough. So this is what we need to do. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, head of Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak, radiallahu anhu, great Imam, a tabi'i. Uh, he said, he used to say that in the beginning I used to mix and inter ang intermingle and interact and mix with the really rich people. And I used to always remain very, very sad. Then I changed and I started changing my friend circle. And I started mixing with the poor people. The day I started mixing with poor people, since that day I've become the happiest person. Because now I'm not looking at people with massive houses and properties and, and you know a lot of cars. I'm looking at people who, who are far worse off than me. So now I am happy. There's another hadith in Sahih Muslim. The question, and that hadith answers this question. We said, that we need to look at people, people, we need to look at people what? Below us. Yeah, everyone paying attention? Inshallah. Oh, this car just died. There's a car? Okay. T955ATY. Nissan Almera. Nissan Almera. Okay, a nice car. <laughs> um, the hadith, that this is the first step. What did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Look at people, look at people below. A question might come, that okay, I'm not going to look at people above me. Don't look at people above you. But I live in a place where automatically I am seeing people above me. I'm not going to seek them out. I'm not going to a really nice posh area or, okay, who's got a nice car? Wow, beautiful house, nice car. I'm not doing all of that. I'm just driving in Sheffield and suddenly a nice Ferrari is passing by me. Or suddenly I see a person with thousands, I just come across someone who's very affluent or someone really good in, in worldly aspects. What do I do now? So the, there's another hadith in the same chapter, or sorry, in the next chapter, Imam Muslim Rahimahullah mentions, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Huraira radiallahu anhu relates, again, answering this question, إِذَا نَظَرَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى مَنْ فُضِّلَ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْمَالِ وَالْخَلْقِ if you happen to, by chance, by coincidence, you did not out of your choice go to find these people, but you were doing your normal work and you, you were going do, doing your normal business and you were going, you know, in your normal day in your life, and you happen to, by chance, see someone better than you or someone given more bounties and ni'mah, someone who is more fortunate than you in terms of wealth and in terms of physical health. If that happens, so the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. If that happens, then what you need to do is then now go intentionally. Go intentionally to the poor people and look for them and seek them out and think about them and look at their state. This will bring about qana and happiness and contentment in the heart. Like I said, go and watch a, uh, a documentary on the really poor people. If you happen to, then this is what you need to do. And in this world, brothers and sisters, we don't have to go anywhere far, even in the same city. As I said, you can go to the internet. But in the same city, in the same place. You know, I mentioned this once before, a few years ago, two years ago, I went to America, California. So LA, everybody has heard of LA, yeah? I've been about three, four times there, but this time, the first time I went, there was a program, there was a conference going on, etc. Because of the first time, every time, you know, I like to just, you know, like to see the world, you know, like uh, go and see some uh, scenery and things like that. And actually, it's in the Quran. Allah says, "Qul siru fil arf anzuru, fil ayanzuru li al ibari li al jibari kif khuliqat wa ila samaa kif rufiyat." So it's good, you know, just to 
So one of the days after the program finished, I said, let's go around. So they took me around some of the friends who were there. We went to see the city and all the outskirts of the city. So there were some dunyawi things as well. We said, let's just see it anyway. No problem. We went, you know, LA is where Hollywood is. They said, you want to go? There's a big sign. I said, no, no, we've seen the sign. We don't want to go. But we went through LA and the streets, and they were just driving me and showing me the city and the area. They went to a really, they, they went to the Hollywood area, and then there's a there's a there's a town there, Hollywood town, which is known to be a very affluent town. And next to it is a small place called Beverly Hills, like mansions, four million property. This house is seventy, you know, seven million, eight million, ten million, two million. You know, house prices are there to start at like three, four million. There's a double hill, there's nothing, I mean, who cares? You know, there's like three, four cars outside. Because they're not happy in internally, most of these people. If they were happy, you know, they would, they, they would not have hardships in their life. They're all internally, you ask all of them. You know, if, if they are sports players or golf players or whatever, they, they're all mentally, psychologically unhappy. And if we change this focus in our mind, you know, seriously, I'm not joking. You look at his house, who cares? I don't even want to go into that house. I'm happy in a nice small house where I'm having my daily food. I'm relaxed mentally. I'm spending time with my family. It's just a short life. Alhamdulillah, go into the next life. That's much more. There's much more happiness in that. So we went to that market. That that sorry that that city center area, downtown they call it. And there's shops there. We went and they said, "Do you want?" I said, no, "We don't want to go. We just we we actually parked and we went just two minutes, just you know, from outside, just to see them some of the shops because in those shops." There, there are some shops, they sell a pair of socks for $2,000. How many thousand dollars? One suit is for $10,000. And a designer, you take, you know, you have to book a designer six months in advance. He will, you have consultation with him. His consultation charges are $10,000 for two hours, where he will, cons he will give you advice, you consult him on what suit to wear on what occasion, what type of tie, what type of suit, you know, this is this is what the world is at. And people are doing that. They're still not happy because remember, this is Ibn Adam, this is human being. You have one, you want another thing, you want you want more and more. These desires, it's like a it's like a you know itch on your body. You the more you scratch, the more, the more, the more, you just keep on wanting more and more. And these people, they mentally they're thinking about something else. You know, I sometimes think seriously, we as human beings, some of us are on absolute different mental levels, psychological levels. Some human beings cannot even get to the level of thinking of other human beings. A person like that, who is buying a 7,000 pounds worth of suit and $2,000 worth of socks, for them to even think for one moment how it is to live in a village in Somalia, for example, they just cannot Think of that. They just will not get it. It's impossible. For them, those are like maybe animals. It's like a different species. Because they have not experienced that in their life. And they are thinking, their problems are like, oh no, I can't, you know, my socks I bought it for 2,000 pounds. It's not the right one. You gave me the wrong one. That's their problem. They're still unhappy. Seriously, there was one brother, actually once, you know, I was with him three, four years ago in Leicester. Just driving, you know, we went together. It was actually a funeral of someone, and then, you know, it was after Salat and Jumar, and somebody was passed away, and everybody was going to the cemetery. So he said, oh, you want to come jump in my car? I said, okay, I'll come in your car. And this person, I mean, I don't know him that well. We just, I'm just talking how, you know, because it takes about 15, 20 minutes to Leicester, you know, cemetery, uh, graveyard, it's quite far. So we're just talking how, alhamdulillah, family and life, everything. He said, yeah, so, so hardship, difficulty, I'm so sad. Make dua, make dua for me, so much problems. You know, this, this was when we were all going through, and people, I don't know if they still are or not, you know, economic struggle, but I don't know what that is, really, seriously. If you're just on a small level, uh, you just, it's the same, you know, these people are struggling financially. So he's saying, I'm struggling financially, and you know, I'm, you know, Shaykh, make dua for me, and then I please ask your father to make dua for me, and I need someone who really, um, it's so hard, life is. I said, why, what's up? He said, it's just so difficult. I have six properties, but you know, uh, I'm saying, hey, wait, wait a minute, I have six properties, but he's going on a... He, what did you just say in one sentence? I have six properties. I, I haven't even dreamed of owning one property if we had six properties. And the guy's talking as though he's, you know, his whole family is being take, taken away from his life or something. Seriously, this is how he's speaking to me. I have six properties, but you know, there's hardship. There's one property, there's the, the business, it's so down. And he has a big business. So his level of hardship and difficulty and understanding and thinking is something totally different to someone who's thinking about, you know what, when will I get my next meal tonight? I might have to sleep hungry because no food. My son, my daughter, my, my young five-year-old daughter is going to sleep hungry because 
There's no food. They're both unhappy. Do you understand my point? Both unhappy. Whether you have six properties, you're still unhappy because mentally you're thinking about something else. This person is also happy because mentally you're thinking about something else. This is why the only thing that will bring peace to that person and this person is qana'a, like we said. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is what he said. That look at people who are below you. So this is the first step, right? What's the first step? Always try to look for, seek out people below us. In deen matters, look at people above us, no doubt. Try to be like the people above us. Aspire to be like the righteous people, the pious people, the good people. Deen doesn't only mean scholars. Yes, people of ilm and knowledge, but not just that. People who are righteous, people of good quality, people of good attributes, someone of good deen and righteousness, someone who's raised up his or her family in a righteous way. Try to be like that person. This is a very good father, very good mother. This is part of deen. So this is what we want to be like, aspire to be like that. In dunya matters, worldly matters, look at people below us. Number two, the second step, and I have to do this quickly, is to remove the love of dunya from the heart. Dunya is needed, but the love of dunya is not needed. We have to take this out. Hubbu dunya ra'su kulli khati'a. The root for every sinful activity and problem in this life, this is a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa is the love of the dunya. We use the dunya, we utilize the dunya, but we take out the dunya <coughs> from our hearts. It's like being in a ship in a boat. We need water around us. We can't live without the water in a boat, in a ship. Otherwise, you know, you know the boat won't uh, travel. We need the dunya. But as long as the, dunya, the water is around the ship, the boat, the moment the water comes into our boat, we drown. The moment dunya comes into our hearts, we drown. This love, this uh, heart that Allah has given us, you can't combine the love of Islam, the love of Allah, His Messenger, and the love of the world. You, you only have one of the two. One of the, someone said, I think it was again Abdullah Mubarak, or someone said that, you know, the love of dunya, uh, um, someone. You know, it's like having two wives. You know, if you, if you make one happy, you'll make the other one unhappy. You can't make them both happy. You make dunya happy, you'll make Allah and His Messenger, you know, the love you have for them, that will suffer. <coughs> if you have the love of Allah and His Messenger, then you don't have the love of dunya. You just can't have them together. Maybe some people can have two wives together, Allahu Alam. But normally, generally, it's like you make one happy, the other one gets unhappy. So, this is the nature of our hearts. We have to remove this love of dunya from the heart. Use the dunya, but take the love of dunya out from the heart. Some of them also said, make dunya your khadim, don't become the khadim of the dunya. Let the dunya serve you, you don't serve the dunya. When we become alka, not alcoholics, billah, when we become workaholics, I need to say alcoholics. Uh, when we become workaholics, we are serving the dunya, we have become slaves of the dunya. We are running after the dunya. That's why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi said, Lu'ina abdu dinari wa abdu dirham. Cursed is the abdu dinar. You know, we say abdullah. This is abdu dinar, the slave of the dinar and dirham. It's like abdul pound and abdul dollar. This is a hadith, cursed. What do you mean by slave? Slave like the servant, the worshiper. Abd is from ibadah. Worship, do we mean that we are worshipping? You know, th does this hadith mean that, okay, the person puts all the pounds in front of him, Allahu Akbar? It doesn't mean that. It means what? It means that the most important thing for this person in his or her life is what? When that thing becomes more important than Allah is Messenger and Deen and Islam and important things in life, then you become a worshipper and a slave and a servant to the world. And that's, that's what we must not do. Not become the khadim of the dunya, not the servant of the dunya. Let this dunya serve us. Okay, use it for a bit. Okay, see you later. Number three, so that was number, the second step. The third step of really acquiring happiness is, this is very important, these are really important steps. Cutting off all expectations from creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Cut off expectations. Expectations are only with Allah. Because if we 
build our expectations with the makhluk, with the creation, we will always be disappointed. And this is actually one of the problems that we have in this world, the way we live in, is that we expect too much from people. We expect too much from human beings. When we are doing good to others, we expect a return. When we want to take a gift to someone, this is the meaning of sincerity. The whole meaning of sincerity and ikhlas is to do everything for the sake of Allah. You are bringing happiness to someone, it's because Allah is pleased, not because even they pleased or not, it's not even for them. When we take a gift, give a gift, don't even wait for Jazakallahu Khairan in return. Don't worry. Don't expect it. If you do get a Jazakallahu Khairan in return, take it as a bonus. I wasn't even expecting. You'll be happy. You took gifts. Now what we do, you know, this is a problem. Our societies are gripped in formalities. When we have a wedding, what we do? We take a list. Ah, they called us. We have to call them. They called us. We have to call them. They called us. This is in the Quran known as riba, interest. These are, these are, you know, problems that we have in our society. We do things because people will take it back. Ah, I have to go there, otherwise they'll take it back. The moment you say that, there's no reward in going to their house. The moment we say, I need to visit them because they'll take it back. No reward, whether you go or not, maybe even be sinful. I need to go there because Allah is pleased. There's a janazah, let me go for the sake of Allah. There's a wedding, let me go for the sake of Allah. There's someone who's come back from a journey from Hajj, let me go bring happiness to the heart of a Muslim for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Tawheed, this is Ikhlas, this is sincerity. Cutting off all expectations from the makhluk. The moment, the day we, you know, if someone is not good back to you in return, you don't expect it, you will never be. We will never be unhappy because we, will, we were not expecting it. We are maintaining ties. You know, lots of times, you know, so many times people talk to me when they talk to me, they say, you know, I do this, I do this, but you know, I don't get anything in return. It's okay. This dunya is not about getting anything in return. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes marriage problems, the wife speaks on the phone. Oh, I do so much, but he doesn't do nothing. It doesn't matter. You carry on doing it. You know, you carry on doing it. When you go in Jannah and you'll see all the rewards that you've got, you probably really would wish more down there that he never even did one thing for you. <coughs> Because the return you got here is so much. It's not a transaction. Personal relationships are not transactions. It's not a business. Okay, five pounds, give me a, you know, a packet of, I don't know what you get for five pounds, but whatever. Give me, give, you know, I'm paying you. Husband's not paying money to the wife, and the wife is not paying money to the husband. Parents are not paying money to the children. Okay, you do something good for me, then I'll do something good for you. Until you know you are not good to me, I will not be good to you. This is not how human beings work. That's, that's why the hadith says, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ بِالْمُكَافِ وَلَكِنَ الْوَاصِلُ الَّذِي إِذَا قُتِعَتْ رَحِمُهُ وَصَلَهَا The real maintainer of ties is when people cut you off, you maintain ties. The one who maintains ties is not the one who returns good for good. That's just normal, that's just, you know, part of humanity. If you can't even do that, then maybe you're an animal. This is what the hadith is saying. If someone's good to me and I am good to them, of course, no big deal. The real person of quality, of attribute, of excellence, of virtue, of high position and rank, is when someone's bad to you, you are good to them. Now you are a gentleman. Okay, that's when you have reached a level of virtue. Otherwise, if someone's good to me and I'm good back, I mean, that's of course expected. That's basic minimum level. So this is what we need to do. Number three, cut off expectations. Cut off expectations. There's a dua, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make, Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi raja'ak. Oh Allah, make all my expectations in my heart with you. Waqta raja'i amal siwak and cut off all my expectations with people besides you, with the creation. So when we have expectations with Allah, expect from Allah, that's it, because you'll never be despondent. Because when you see in Akhirah, you'll never be you know, um, despondent. So cutting off all expectations from humanity, that was number three. Number four and number five and number six, just very quickly. Number four, keep on and constantly and regularly and continuously remember death. Remember the shortness of this life. Akfiru. The hadith, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذِي مِدَ الذَّاتِ جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ Continue, excessively remember that which cuts off all pleasures. And not just level, uh, not just thinking about dunya, uh, uh, about death. Think about death, but think about, seriously, the temporary nature of this life. Every difficulty, hardship will become insignificant. 
you know, I mentioned to you, and most of you, if not all of you know, we had an incident in Leicester a couple of weeks ago. You heard probably in the BBC and news and in the media uh, where there was a house fire and the whole family passed away. It was basically just our masjid madrasa and the, 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 the husband, his Dr. Tawfiq, we know him very well, he actually lives in Aydin. And he, he, he is actually originally from Pakistan, Karachi, but uh, he moved to Saudi Arabia. He's a, he's a neurosurgeon, a brain surgeon. Seriously, if you look at it, it's so simple. This guy, Allah, he, I really think he is a wali of Allah, seriously. I mean, I haven't known him for a long time. My family know him very well, but because I'm so busy, I, don't get, I didn't get to meet him. But I spoke to him on the phone once only, but I've met him quite a bit after these incidents because he was the first thing he ate at my father's house and my brother's house, and he's very close. Now this... Neurosurgeon. He moved to Ireland. He runs a masjid. On his with his own money, he built a built an Islamic center. He has aspirations. He has so much love for Deen. He sacrifices family because of Islam. His wife and three children, all of them, came and lived in Leicester. And he was just for a short term. They were actually thinking end of this year they all were going to move back. His wife in her mid forties. She started becoming an alima, studying deen. Okay, last year before Ramadan, she graduated as an alima in her forties. Okay, his one daughter was in the final year of being an alima. This year, she started Sahih al Bukhari and the six books of Hadith. One son, 19, uh, 17 year old Jamal, he finished Hibz of the Quran and he started. Uh, alim class first year and the other son was in the, another, another darum he did 20 parts juice of the Quran as being a hafiz at night what happened the whole family got fire imagine this man could we imagine you come back you're in Ireland you get the news not just your wife has passed away your daughter's passed away and your two sons your whole family wiped out the face of the earth imagine seriously when I saw him this was this happened on Friday night these people were shaheed, martyred, burnt in fire, and uh, you know, uh, Friday nights, again, a great virtue. Tulabul al great virtue. Travelers, great virtue. He, this was 12 o'clock at night, he took, he came 8 in the morning from Ireland, took the flight. He found out, I saw him straight at the Jum'ah. He offered Jum'ah Salah in, in our masjid, and he, I saw him. Seriously, you see, the guy is, you know, he is very, very sad, of course, internally. I'm going to end, inshallah. Just can I just do two three minutes and do we give a run after that? Is it okay? Just just ten to inshallah. Uh, this is very important. This when I saw him, and seriously, if you saw him and the brothers, some of them, we had a program on that Saturday, a special program for him. Many scholars spoke, and then he spoke, and his talk was far more effective than any of the speeches that took place. You know, he read ayat of the Quran. He know he knows. He actually, you know, actually reads from Ma'arif al Quran and seen in his masjid in front of the Masjid. He has a lot of knowledge of Deen and his family, they're all scholars now. And they all gone to the Akhirah. He said, Look, I could stand here and I could go in a corner and just say, I'm, I'm half dead and my life has finished and that's it. But I'm not going to do that. I am firm. This is the decree of Allah. Allah took them away, Allah gave them Shahada. I sacrificed them for Deen and Islam and they've been accepted. This is what I wanted, and they've been accepted. I'm not going to sit and cry here. I'm going to carry on the mission of my family. And he, he, the way he spoke, seriously, so much iman and yaqeen and belief and conviction in the heart to the point that, you know, I was telling some of my students the other day that, you know, when you see him, it's as though, you know, what the, the picture that you can point, point, paint here is that imagine him and his family were traveling going from Sheffield to London, and you all stopped where? At the service station in Luton, okay? And you were there, just for half an hour, one hour. People want to use the washroom, toilet, etc. You want to have a small cup of coffee or whatever, tea. And the father went, said, okay, I'm just, you know, there was a train station or whatever. I'm just going, I need to go and buy something. And he's gone down there, and suddenly he comes back and sees by chance or mistake or something happened, they were pushed and they were taken. They've already gone, and they've gone to London. And he's missed the train. The train's gone. Imagine. Oh no. My whole family's gone. Will you be really, really sad? Will you be really sad? You'll be slightly sad. I was enjoying the company. Oh, another 30 miles from here to where? London. I could have chatted with them, had another coffee with them. We would have gone together. It's okay. Next train, when is it? 
that night or tomorrow morning. Okay, I'll go tomorrow morning and then I'll be with them. Are you happy? You're sad a bit because you couldn't travel with them. But are you very sad? No, because you know, tomorrow morning you've got the next flight to go or the next train to go. They've, they've just gone a bit early from you. This is the, if somebody has that thought, do you think you'll be so uh, absolutely upset? When you have the yaqeen of death, of the next life, when we have extreme amount of conviction of the next life, we have a strong iman, we know and realize this life is so short that anything can happen in this world. Your whole family can be wiped off from the face of the earth. You, you'll be slightly sad, but internally you'll be content. Okay, it's not a problem. They've all gone. You're actually happy they've gone and if they came with me, maybe it could be some problems. Here they were shaheed. They've definitely entered paradise. You, you're actually more happy internally. So this was step number uh, uh, four, which is thinking about death and considering this world to be very short. Five and six, just in one minute. Something very important is that we should try to start off our day every morning of a Salat al-Fajr on time. After that, spend some time reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Quran, with the fakr, with the dabur, with the reflection. Brings a lot of peace. A day started on a good way, on the right foot, Early in the morning, don't wake up at 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, whether it's Sunday or Saturday. Wake up early, there's barakah in the morning. And start off with at least 20, 30 minutes of recitation of the Qur'an. Inna Qur'an al-Fajr kana mashura. Last time I gave a talk here in Sheffield at uh, uh, place on Qur'an. You know, just how we should recite the Qur'an. So, this is very important. Qur'an is shifa ulima fi sudur. It brings peace and contentment in the heart number five just externally well number six yeah number six externally try to be happy and smile even if you have difficulties just try to be as much as possible cheery this is actually the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there's a hadith basaman dahakan he was always smiling always had a smile always and Jalil ibn abdullah al-bajari says Never did I see the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except that he smiled in my face. So, very important to bring a smile. And lastly, number seven, get yourself busy. Do some meaningful work. Because you know, when we have boredom in our life, then we have more time to fight and argue and quarrel. She said this, he said that, my sister-in-law said this, my brother-in-law said this, oh, she said this. Why? Because we are not busy. People who are busy, they don't have time to quarrel and argue. So have some meaningful, you know, have focus. You, our lives, and this is the last line, our lives should be such that every day we are fighting against time and struggling, we have so much work that we don't have time to be unhappy. You bring that in your life. Just take on work. Seriously, sometimes, I'll just give you my own example. Sometimes the day is so short until I'm awake till 2 a.m. I need to write this, I need to check this, I need to do this, I need to do that. Constantly, there's just so much work in your life. You don't have time if someone swore at you. You don't find time to swear at them back. You know, okay, I need to swear at them back, but there's no time. You know, you don't even have time to reply to a text message, let alone, you know, say something. You know, just yesterday I actually had, I looked at my phone and there's about 20 text messages from two weeks, and then I just took out, I replied to all those 20 text messages yesterday after two weeks. There's one very important one, but just struggling with time. Once we do that, because remember, fights and arguments bring what? Hardship in life, because when we are arguing, quarrels, they bring the depression. So if you do that, take meaningful work, and inshallah with that, happiness will come. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me, you, all of us, the happiness of this life, next life, the eternal, real happiness, contentment of the heart.